Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our public health students. My name is Dele Ogunteka. I'm a professor and chair in public health here at UC Irvine. And I've been here for about, I don't know, a quarter of a century. <laughs> I stopped counting. So welcome to Public Health Practicum. There are um, a few things that we're doing differently, which is a privilege for this particular class. Um, one is that we're going to be videotaping all of the lectures. And for that, we have the Office of Extension to thank. And our gentleman in the back uh, represents that office. And I'd like him to maybe say a little bit about his uh, background. And uh, we've been working together now for about two years. Yeah, about two years. So I'm Shant, and uh, I work for UCI Extension for the Courseware. And um, we're, yeah, like you said, we're videotaping the whole lecture series. So one, there's two ways to find the lectures. They're all going to be on YouTube. So you can search UCI OCW, two words, because um, we're part of OpenCourseWare, so OCW. And we'll have a playlist for the class. So every, every lecture will be uploaded on that one playlist. Or you can just search the professor's name or the class name, and you can find it through YouTube there. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. It's an award-winning site. It's really a good uh, innovation for our campus. UCI was one of the early adopters of open courseware, which facilitates uh, discussions, interactions, but it's also accessible worldwide. So a lot of what we're saying, you can imagine that we are Nobody's faces will be shown, uh, but your questions uh, will be heard by people from more than a hundred different countries, and sometimes they email responses, their own questions, and if that happens during the quarter, I'll bring, bring them back. So it's a really global uh, education. Uh, we started doing the series uh, with our <coughs> seminars, which you're all invited to attend on Mondays at noon. But this is a very special course. We call it the public health uh, practicum and culminating experience. And for that reason, um, it's, uh, you're all going to be very busy. You're all having uh, placement sites outside of the university. Uh, sometimes it's within the university, but doing public health practice. And what's unique about the course is that it integrates all of the didactic, classroom instruction that you received in methodology concepts uh, with practice. It's also a very important course because it fulfills the upper division writing requirements. So a lot of the heavy lifting in the class, in addition to your hours at the public health agency, um, you will be writing a lot about those experiences. And we'll be giving you feedback. Does anyone know why the color? Have you all visited our website? Yeah? Why is the color <coughs> salmon? They call it pink, but it is actually salmon. Why is that? Huh? Nobody has a guess? All right. Well, um, I, it's not my favorite color. I prefer blue myself. but. Uh, all academic disciplines and professional disciplines have a color, right? So if you go to graduation and you earn a, a doctorate in some field, or actually a master's degree, the color of the hood that you wear traditionally depicts the discipline in which you specialize. And for public health, salmon is that color, okay? So just wanted to let you know. Um, please visit the website often, and it turned out to be one of the options uh, on EEE. So immediately I thought I should make that the first lesson of the quarter. Mm -hmm. So when you get your graduate degree in public health, you will be wearing a salmon colored hood. Uh, our logo for the course essentially represents public health at the international level. What symbol is this? The World Health Organization. If I block this. <laughs> the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. 
a lot of people forget the prevention part, right? We just call it CDC, but it's and prevention. Public Health Service, the National Institute of Health at the national level, and we have also county level, state levels, <coughs> community level, like the Latino Health Access. Many of you have internships that um, are going to span activities across all these areas of public health. The course is designed so that you learn from one another, regardless of where you're doing your practicum uh, projects, and that you're able to write about those projects in the context, community, local, regional, national, global health context. Everything we do, as I mentioned, um, people are listening all over the world. And it's important to realize the interconnectedness across all of these scales of public health. So um, on our website, I will be putting all kinds of information. You hopefully have downloaded the syllabus. The lecture slides will be posted ahead of class as drafts. If we do something different, I'll repost it as a permanent one. I uh, expect that you consult it regularly. Databases such as the World Health Statistics, so if you're looking for data on any kind of disease, how many people in the world suffer from it? How much money are we spending? Where are the experts? Uh, the World Health Statistics comes out every year. It's published by the World Health Organization. I expect that you are able to access that information and use data in your writing. There's nothing as dry as writing that sounds like it's just based on your anecdotal experience or opinions. When you support things with statistical uh, least supported data, it puts more emphasis on uh, the rigor of your research that you conducted before uh, writing um, and interpreting your opinion. We will have some speakers in, in the class who uh, will be recognized by some of you. They are practicum site uh, preceptors. They are experts in their disciplines. Um, and we will update the roster as frequently as we get speakers. But already, there are some speakers. I think five or six are listed on the, on the table. Uh, human subjects research, uh, public health service, policy assurances, and grants. So information that has to do with the writing assignments that you have will be included at this site. Also are all of these policies that are relevant to our work. So that's our introduction to the website. It will be used frequently. We also use the EEE uh, Dropbox for evaluations, for grading, for keeping time. OK. For, I know that you spend a lot of time at the field sites, and you spend time at the uh, discussion sections. Um, we're not trying to make you just do the practicum all quarter and nothing else. So when we meet on Wednesdays, um, we will do introduction to the new topics, to the new assignments, techniques, methodology, uh, and a little bit of troubleshooting. But I expect that most of the revisions, uh, you know, troubleshooting grammar, uh, writing styles will take place at the discussion sessions, and that's why it's required for you to attend those. It's also required that you that you attend this particular lecture because a lot of the framework for the course is defined uh, in this forum. I will try to make sure we get out uh, early, typically, because the messages are very precise, and we're trying to make sure that you don't spend too many hours uh, on this one course at the expense of your other courses. Most of you are graduating seniors, if not all of you, and this is not the time to play around with getting a bad grade on any particular course. So I encourage you to uh, pay attention to time management, and we will do our best to make this you know, uh, period it's 1 to 350 on the on the schedule of classes. Uh, I think most of what we have to do we can get done within a couple of hours. 
In the first hour, I will typically give a lecture, and then we may have a guest presentation. So today, uh, between 1 and about 2, uh, I will talk about the, the course, the expectation uh, in the orientation session. And then um, Stephanie Leonard, most of you have either emailed her, met with her. She, uh, in addition to our counseling services uh, for the program in public health, she also coordinates the practicum course. And she's going to come later on this afternoon to talk a little bit about uh, best practices in practical and community experiences, what to look for uh, in terms of pitfalls that may derail your experience and what may enrich those experiences as you proceed. She had to uh, go uh, make a presentation to uh, a set of parents whose, kids, whose children have been invited to uh, join UC Irvine as freshmen in the fall. So, uh, we push this a little bit uh, forward, so she'll be here around 2 o'clock. Then we'll usually take a break uh, halfway through. Um, if we're going all three hours, if we're not going all three hours, we don't really need a break, but I, I think three hours uh, is perhaps too long without a break. And then we'll come back, and uh, I want to hear from uh, most of you about your practicum uh, projects, if you visited already, if you started, if you're not started, that's okay. We just want to have a baseline uh, information on where you are with the um, practicum sites and your project. Are there any questions uh, about the website, the TA and reader support, or how we are going to structure the course? Or any question about anything? No? Okay. Most of you uh, will have to try to reach me at some time in the quarter. The best way is to send me an email. I have office hours by appointment. Typically, if you send me an email, we need to meet and talk. I will find a, a mutually convenient time to do that meeting. But most of the questions can be answered very quickly uh, by email. So, um, one of the uh, remarkable events that happened last year um, is that we were accredited by the Council on Education for Public Health. We're one of the few campuses that include the undergraduate program in the accreditation of public health training. And that's a, a, a great thing for you all. What that means also is that our curriculum has been reviewed uh, by experts around the country compared to other curricula, including graduate curricula. How well do we prepare you for graduate studies? How well do we prepare you for professional practice in public health? And how well we prepare you for professional development in other health science disciplines such as medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, um, and so on and so forth. So we're required to have these competencies um, that by the end of your training, if we give you a questionnaire, you should be able to rate yourself, your level of knowledge, that's on a scale of one to 10, that here is where you are um, by the time you graduate. Of course, our expectation is that you're at 100%. But that's not always the case, but this is a good time to catch that. So I uh, will give you a questionnaire uh, based on these competencies. But for now, I just want to go over them with you and see if you recognize them. So let's see a show of hands. How many here are in the Bachelor of Arts degree? Okay. So we typically have about, we have about 1,200 undergraduate students in public health. About one third are in the Bachelor of Arts in public health policy. And here are the degree competencies. How many of you saw this before? You should all have seen this before. Yeah. So how uh, comfortable are you? Again, the videotape is not capturing your faces, so you, you can 
just shout out a number. I, I might even face the wall so I don't see who you are. But just be, be, be frank, okay? Uh, it, how comfortable are you? How competent are you in applying health concepts of public health? Grounded in an ecological perspective to articulate natural and social determinants of health status in communities and the dynamic interplay among these factors of all of which affect the health of populations. I should probably say how many of you even understand what that means. Sometimes it's a little bit cumbersome to interpret. But somebody tell me what you think that means and how comfortable you think you are at this point. Do I have to face the wall? Don't be shy. I don't know your names yet. By the end of the quarter, I'll know faces and names. So. What does that mean? What's the ecological perspective in public health? Yes? Well, using population studies instead of uh, ethical-based studies. There are two main key words that define public health. Okay. Population level, prevention. Um, ecological perspective, however, typically means that we think of health of populations as an ecosystem. In an ecosystem, you have the animals, you have the plants, you have the bacteria, you have energy from the sun, you have um, fungi that degrade the leaves, um, you have temperature, you have all kinds of influences affecting the stability of the ecosystem. So an ecological perspective in public health means that we take into consideration all of the factors that affect the health of the population. If you're in medicine, you might say, okay, we take a curative approach. Here's the disease, here's what's going to cure it. And you look at the individual, the biological basis of the disease. In public health, we think about the social factors. If somebody comes with asthma, they may have a genetic predisposition to asthma. They may be living in a place with allergens, like cockroach dust or, or smog. They may be living next to the freeway, so we think about the urban planning aspect of their living um, conditions. If you're a physician, you diagnose the problem, you recommend the right medication. If you're in public health, you ask about all of those other factors. Where do you live? How clean is it? Your socioeconomic status. You don't want to ask someone directly. You have cockroaches in your house. But you have a way of getting that information and to know whether or not that might be contributing to the disease. Because one of the problems we have in healthcare today is that we can diagnose the problem, give medication, and send people back to the exact same places where they get sick. And so it's a recurring cycle. You should be able to rank yourselves by thinking, do you understand what the ecological perspective means? Do you understand the natural determinants of health, the social determinants of health, and that this do interplay uh, and they <coughs> interplay and interact to affect the health of populations? Typically, the way you can do it in a self-assessment is to pick a disease, any disease and trying to figure, like I did with asthma, what would be an ecological perspective for understanding that disease in the population? What populations are affected? What would be the natural factors and the social factors? And what would be uh, the kind of interplay among these factors? Okay, so let me pick a disease for you, so just so we are clear that um, you are able to rate yourself. Let's uh, pick diabetes. Okay. So someone tell me what might be considered an ecological perspective for understanding diabetes. What is diabetes? <coughs> Come on. Somebody ask. Yes. Diet. Well, first tell us what you, what um, diabetes is. Well, I guess it's um, the inability of your body to regulate the Okay, and what are the symptoms that individuals feel? Um, <laughs> a lot of stuff. 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, if somebody is diabetic, uh, their blood sugar fluctuates dramatically. Right? So if they if they have very low blood sugar, they might just faint and collapse because they can't they can't uh, keep keep up. Um, and if they consistently have high blood sugar, a lot of their organs will fail. Uh, the kidney goes, the eye goes. Okay? So it's a very expensive disease. And what would you say is the population level, what we call the <coughs> prevalence of diabetes? What do we know about it now? This is not a test. I um, thank you for volunteering. Yeah. What are people saying about diabetes? Well, it's a lot to do with your diet. Like what you eat. Right. But that it's also increasing in prevalence in the American population. And we don't quite understand all the details. And that we think that if you are eating a lot of yeah, high carbohydrate, sugary diets, that might create a problem for the body. What is the biological basis? What is the biological entity? Let's call it physiological entity. That's involved in diabetes. Insulin. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be able to, part of the ecological perspective is understanding the biological angle, the insulin regulation and the metabolism, which has to do also with the diet and how you induce insulin with high levels of sugary diet. So the um, level of that enzyme goes up and down, and that trains the body to do certain things. What else has been responsible for? So let's take diet. What, what do you think affects <coughs> the diet of Americans that might explain the increase in the incidence <coughs> of diabetes? Eating fast food. Eating fast food. And why do people do that? It's cheap, so socioeconomic status. It's available, every corner. Right. What else? Even if you eat a lot of fast food, if you do something else, it might not have yeah, physical activity. You have to design communities to allow that. You have to have work rules that allow people to have time to go exercise. If we sit here. I also said policy. Policy. What kind of policy? Like any in the state level or any policy that, that makes certain community access to a certain health care um, facility right. or even be able, be able to run. From national level, I mean, Mrs. Obama, right, mm -hmm. wanting to make that priority for policy. And that trickles <coughs> down to uh, the level of states and counties. Uh, two weeks ago, and if you look at our public health website, you might see pictures of me at the Latino Health Access. Uh, two Saturdays ago, we were uh, there walking a uh, four block um, region in downtown Santana because the Latino Health Access has a wellness corridor project where they're trying to make it possible or easy for people to walk downtown Los uh, Santana. And we, I'm on the steering committee for, for the implementation of this project. And one of, we did it, it was about 27 of us, from age three to age 80. And we did it trying to figure out what would be the impediments to walking in this region. The time of day, of course, matters, because the street lights don't always walk, and nobody's going to go walking when it's a little bit dark. Um, somebody held on to a piece of uh, styrofoam cup that they drank from, uh, and all through the uh, two mile uh, length, there was no garbage can to toss it. And that's a discouragement. Mm. Uh, an older gentleman had to use the bathroom, public toilets. It was just not possible. So those are the things that make it a, an incentive to walk or a disincentive to walk. And we had to work with the uh, city officials to note down these things. We saw several kiosks that sell food and drinks. And of course, you can imagine what they sell. You know, they're sh very sugary drinks, uh, 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 you know, Coca-Cola and, and, and Sprite. Uh, they also sell all kinds of sugar-coated uh, uh, fruit bars, which could be made 
um, better if they understood the health impacts of just having those kinds of foods accessible. So that that's a you could pick another disease, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, stroke, or you could pick uh, <coughs> neurological disease. One of the biggest challenges for the world is mental health issues, which we have very limited way of preventing. Uh, but understanding these ecological factors, the natural and social determinants, and how they inter interact allows us to be able to define um, how best we can uh, improve the health of the population. That's just one of the competencies. I encourage you to go down to all the others. Each degree has six of these competencies, and I'll send this out to you for a, a sort of self-assessment. Okay? Think, think about them. It's not going to be affecting your grade or anything, but at a senior level, graduating senior in public health, you need to be comfortable with your level of understanding and be able to write <coughs> an essay. You, know, you pick a disease and you write an essay. A case study in public health practice to reveal cross-cutting themes, principles, and strategies for addressing a persistent and emerging contemporary challenges, epidemiologic and quantitative methods, you all taking courses in statistics, epidemiology, um, assessing the health conditions of a population, um, you know, social and behavioral health, health policy management, health policy is required, so it's uh, health behavior, right, for, for the impact of acts and public health policy. The last, this, the last two um, are particularly relevant to the practice. It demonstrates the ability to apply cumulative knowledge of the interactions between social and behavioral health risk factors and vulnerable populations to support disease prevention <coughs> policies at public health agencies, which is your practicum site, or other field-based settings. And apply abstract reasoning and critical thinking skills to communicate public health research and practice to public and professional audiences. So, the first four you should have gotten out of the lower division and upper division of courses. The last two are explicitly about the practical. At the public health agency that is doing <coughs> the public health work of disease prevention, how do your courses in social and behavioral health sciences contribute to those solutions? Okay? And you should be able to write about this, talk about it, maybe present a poster. In this class, we'll be doing a lot of writing, and at the end, you'd have to make a presentation. So pay attention to those. The same thing is true. I assume all the others are in the Bachelor of Sciences in Public Health. And um, a lot of what we expect are uh, emphasis in uh, epidemiology, genetics, health informatics, environmental and global health sciences, infectious and chronic diseases, where you put a lot of emphasis in the natural sciences aspects of diseases. But the first ones are exactly the same. Okay? You should be able to understand the ecological perspective, how natural and social science uh, determinants interplay to affect the health of populations, the use of epidemiologic and quantitative methods. And in your practicum, I'm expecting that you understand how cumulative knowledge of the interaction between natural health risk factors and vulnerable populations uh, interact to support disease prevention programs. So at the site in Santana um, in a Wellness Corridor, for example, you might be asking different kinds of questions. One of the things they asked me to contribute to the steering committee for the wellness corridor is, how do we know if we're making progress? Let's say we uh, convince the city, we convince the merchants to do everything perfectly right, everybody's now working. How do we know that it will make a difference in the incidence of diabetes? 
How do you measure substance? What time frame do you need? You know, it may be that the increasing incidence may be something happened to the genetic risk factor. In which case, there's no amount of walking and uh, dieting that may change uh, some of the incidents. What should be the target level? Where should we be aiming as the place where there's diminishing, diminishing returns? Okay? We can spend a lot of money and not have any more impact. That's a biological basis of the disease. And there are different kinds of diabetes that may contribute uh, the childhood uh, and the adult onset. I mean, you have to look at what is more important in particular communities. So regardless of where you're doing your public health practicum, whatever that agency is, if you're in the sciences, I expect that your writings for the course reflect a basic understanding of the biological underpinnings of the disease. And that, that should be included in everything you do. Not that you should ignore the social sciences, they're always relevant, but that it's reflected in your selection of site, in your ability to write about them, and also the way you present writing, oral, and other forms of communication. Okay, any questions about these competencies and how they are relevant to the practicum course? So as I mentioned, the major competencies, uh, competency one, two, three, four, by the time you are completing the upper division requirements, uh, epidemiology cause, public health one, public health two, you should be very, very comfortable with this. I'm not judging you if you're not, but this is a time to reflect. What did I miss? Why can't I understand some of these concepts or use them critically in my thoughts and my writing? And in the practicum course is where we expect that all of those competencies are integrated. That you pick a problem and you are able to address those problems with all of the concepts and methods that you've acquired. Okay, so um, for this particular course, uh, the aspect of it that we call the culminating experience really is what I just said in the matrix. It's where everything you've learned so far culminates in a project that you do in collaboration with the public health agency and your preceptor and that you write about. So the courses that are didactic, the lectures and the exams, uh, have laid the foundation for the practice, and that's important. Uh, and then you will be required to do your hours at the practicum site, and uh, this is experiential. Uh, it's graded by evaluation of performance in terms of qualitative measures. How well did you carry out the project? How well did you interact with the professionals at the agency? We don't have a final exam for the course, so uh, you have to pass, you have to not only complete the hours, but kind of get a good evaluation from the preceptor. And then uh, it will provide you an opportunity to think about careers in public health. Um, the practicum is not going to be the kind of place where you're stuck. Okay? So some use the practicum to explore. How would I feel working at a hospital or at Latino Health Access or at um, American Lung Association um, or at the Orange County Health Care <coughs> Agency? How would I feel building my career there? And a lot of people end up getting valuable experience but realize that's not the right place for them or the right level. And for some people, it's just the perfect fit, and they've been retained uh, as employers at those agencies. So it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to kind of know what's the right kind of working environment for you and the career goals that come with those kinds of environments. So it's, it's not a judgment. It's just say it's about fit, and it allows you to test out 
what might be a possibility for future career or further education. We have, just like the competencies, we have six learning experiences or learning objectives for the course, this 2195W. Um, because you have one leg out in the community, in the public health agency, and one leg in the classroom when we meet on Wednesdays <coughs> and at the discussion sections, you're going to be appraising the relationship between what you learn, <coughs> excuse me, in the classroom and what it means to be out there working in the public uh, work environment. <coughs> You'll be able to analyze and critically evaluate the platform site facility uh, mission and operation. So one of the assignments, for example, is that you interview your preceptor. What are their goals? What are the challenges? Um, where would they like to be in 10 years, for example? What's you know, blocking their path? Where are they going for resources? What is this are they focusing on? What are their priorities? And then your own values, attitudes, and skills, and preferences for future employment. Part of that is the competencies that I will send to you, and you will have this self evaluation. And then you'll be able to articulate the role of public health in society and how you fit into the discipline and workplace. And you'll be able to apply the public health concepts and methods to community problems and activities and effectively communicate in writing and oral formats and contemporary public health topics. Welcome to Stephanie. We're, oh, she's early. Please uh, have a seat somewhere. We don't have, uh... okay, thank you. So th these are our learning objectives for, for the course. Um, I'm going to be bringing them back periodically to kind of evaluate you know, have we accomplished this? If you feel you are not comfortable with it, we have a questions and answer period where we talk about what about this particular objective um, remains to be uh, covered or accomplished in the time we have. So as I mentioned, we already introduced the, uh, the course readers uh, and the TA. Uh, discussion sections are extremely important because um, we, we have a situation where a lot of people who go through lower division writing at UCI, <coughs> excuse me, are kind of introduced to scholarly writing. And over the past years, I have, and my colleagues have realized that by the time many of our students get to upper division, there's still a lot of writing uh, skills to cultivate and to master. And so having that one-on-one -on -one discussion with uh, the TA is very important uh, to get feedback. And all of the readers have done this before. So they have gone through papers like yours, maybe from the same uh, agency. And so they have a, a fundamental understanding of the general idea of what you're trying to say. We focus on how effectively did you communicate your thoughts to the reader. And um, we're required, because it's an upper division writing uh, fulfilling course, to give you feedback. That's not as penalized as the final version. So you, you can make mistakes. I put a lot of emphasis on why you're able to correct those mistakes in the final version. It's very important that you take into consideration the feedback that you get uh, from comments on your paper. So these in-progress papers and the feedback uh, before the formal submission, to me, that's the learning part. That's the part that should be graded most heavily. Okay? If you repeatedly make the same mistakes, it means your learning writing skills are not improving. Okay? And that's a very critical part of the course grade. Attendance is required uh, in the specific section uh, for which you are enrolled. Okay, <clears throat> we don't have uh, a required textbook, but it's always a good idea to have some 
uh, resources at hand to help you with writing files. Um, and this is getting a little bit old now. Effective writing for health professionals, a practical guide for, for getting published. It's, a, it's an excellent resource. It, you know, it, things don't change much in terms of what you need to do to write for an audience. Um, clarity, simple language, <coughs> organization, um, and you know, reading and reading it over and over again to make sure you don't have uh, obvious mistakes, grammatical errors, for example. That shouldn't be <coughs> present anymore in this day and age of um, style check. But note that not everything can be done um, cap captured by, by spell check. So you still have to be very careful in uh, reading. And one of the exercises I, I've done in the past, and I hope we do in the discussion sections, is peer review. So we trade papers and you read your, your colleague's paper and, and give your honest opinion about what you thought uh, the, reader, the writer was trying to say. And then we do it again uh, so that you also get feedback from your own paper. Reading references to citing your papers is important. And I find this miniature guide to critical thinking an excellent resource in allowing you to cultivate a habit of reading text critically. You don't just take everything you read on face value. The worst thing you can do is to cut and paste from a reference into your own <coughs> writing. Because one, even if you cite, that begins to be very close to plagiarism. You read, you think about it, you don't have to agree with everything you read. You don't have to disagree with everything. But it has to be obvious that you digested it, that you thought about it in your own terms, using your own values and knowledge to evaluate uh, what aspect of that literature you find credible. If you have difficulty with their methodology, you should be able to explain that here they miss the point or here they're obscure and the conclusions are not supported by the argument. I mean, those kinds of things are important to cultivate. It doesn't come, nobody is born with the ability to do critical thinking. You have to learn it and you have to practice it. And part of uh, the, this course is to allow you to exercise that skill of critical thinking about literature and how you interpret it into your own writing. And then there is more of an encyclopedia uh, book on writing, uh, A to Z, that you can look up things like formatting, uh, grammar, uh, <coughs> sentence construction. <coughs> And then, uh, in addition to this, you can. They, these are not. This is free of charge. You can maybe two dollars if you have to pay for it. <coughs> they are not expensive books at all. And then uh, there are many, many resources on the website. So, uh, for some assignments, for example, the uh, opposite editorial opinion editorial submissions, you can find a whole website on the op-ed project. Uh, by clicking on that. Duke University has their own uh, uh, resources for writing op-eds. Scholarly reviews, public health journals, you can click on that and there's a ton of them. They all have instructions for authors, so um, you just have to be consistent. And then on writing abstract, whether you're submitting a grant proposal for funding or a scholarly review, the abstract and the title are critical. You want to capture the attention of the reader by drawing them in with a very strong, powerful title. And the abstract will capture what's to follow. You know, every aspect of the writing uh, needs to be in miniature size presented in the abstract. A lot of scholarly journals, most people just read the abstract to know is this relevant or not. And so I put a lot of emphasis on how well crafted your title is and how well developed the abstract is to tell me the essence of your writing. <coughs> so, uh, brings us to grading. We mentioned this before. You have to be here in the classroom. You also have to be at your practical site. There's no shortcut to that. Uh, 
100 hours and evaluation at the site, that's the minimum. Good evaluation. And <coughs> excuse me, time, timely completion and submission of all the writing assignments uh, that we will do. <coughs> I forgot to bring my water. Okay, uh, so here are the assignments. It's also present in the syllabus, it's online. We've made it very uh, straightforward. There are a total of 200 points. And for each assignment, we have an ability to help you uh, revise. Uh, and the due dates, so we already have one coming up um, in about two weeks. Interviewing your precept about the organization. What do they do, what the challenges are and so on. A scholarly review, an outline we expect you to submit about the same time. And then um, the first major assignment is the writing for the public. This is a newspaper opinion uh, article. Usually I encourage you to um, go to Google News, pick a topic that's relevant to your agency. Let's say you are at the American Lung Association. You can type in lung cancer or emphysema or asthma. See what's published in the last week, Google News. Okay? <coughs> Read the article. They're usually very interesting because they're for the general public. And then imagine that um, you're a member of the public and you feel very strongly about that article and you want to reply to the um, editor. Have your own also published. So the draft can be about 500 words. The final version, 500750 uh, words. It depends on the newspaper. So I expect you that you actually have a newspaper in mind. So when you first retrieve that article on Google News, it's published in, let's say, CNN or New York Times or LA Times, Orange County Register, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago Tribune, any of those newspapers. It could be a magazine. Now you're replying. They all have expectations, but typically it's under a thousand watts. So it's not a lot, but it needs to communicate very effectively, very quickly uh, to a large audience so that the newspaper uh, editors will uh, want it. We have had many students actually publish their opinions in newspapers in different parts of the country. So we expect that you will submit what you write as the final version to an actual newspaper. And for that, you get five points to work the course. And then we begin on the second assignment, which is the scholarly review article. Uh, you start with the abstract, the title and abstract. And as I said, this really should be clear. Mini versions of the paper. Okay. Um, you put a lot of thought to it. The draft, 1,500 words. The final version, 1,500 words. Okay. And the due dates in May. For scholarly review articles, you're writing for a pair of scholars, colleagues who actually do research or done a lot of thinking about the topic, right? So <coughs> it's just like with the newspaper article, you go to Google News, you pick it topic, a, a publication on the topic of interest to you and your practicum site, you read it and you respond. The alternative to Google News is Google Scholar. You can use the same keyword in Google Scholar, limit the time frame so that it's a more or less recent article, maybe published in the last three years, about that topic. And they are typically research articles published by investigators, typically at the universities, research institutes, who are working actively on the cutting edge knowledge of that, on that disease. Read it as your first reference. Read it critically. What are their, what's the hypothesis? What are the objectives, their methods? What were their findings, the results, and how did they discuss it in the conclusions and recommendations? Those should be clear to you. If it's not, go back to Google Scholar, pick another article that really goes to 
the questions that you're framing in your mind about the problem facing that particular disease or health service. <clears throat> so I'd expect you to uh, then build on that initial article you find. Maybe you find another 10 and then you start building you know, an outline uh, for your uh, final, uh, for your draft and, uh, and hopefully we'll give you good feedback that you can submit a very good final draft. <coughs> The uh, last major writing assignment is a grant proposal. Um, and here you're working, this is probably what most of the practicum sites do for a living. They all have to raise money to support their work, their project. Some of you will be involved in that process. Okay? Uh, let's say the American Lung Association needs a, to put up a program and they need to raise funds for it. You have to write a proposal. You have to say, here's what we're planning to do. Please give us money. That's what a grant <coughs> means. And there, there's no better way to, to get money than to make a very strong case. That's what we all do in academia, in agencies. Otherwise, nothing gets done. Um, the draft, this, this is long because there are many categories of information that you have to put in to convince somebody to give you money. In many cases, we are talking millions of dollars that people are requesting to put up a program to eradicate a certain disease from a particular population. You know, the wellness program that I talked about in Santana that I'm involved with, we have like 17 different funding agencies that have donated money to it, and for each one, there had to be a proposal saying, we want you to help us with this aspect of this. We want you to help us with that aspect of it. If you've ever walked along that uh, corridor, you would notice that the Latino Health Access Community uh, Center, it's not open yet, but it's completely built up. They're just waiting for the city to give the go-ahead. Wonderful building in the middle of downtown where people and children can come and play and exercise and meet. It took 10 years to raise the funds and another 10 years or so to build it up. Okay. These things take a long time. Many, many people contributed to that with funding from different sources. But they have to have a goal in mind. Our goal is to improve the health of the community. By building this center, we would be able to accomplish that goal. But well, what evidence do you have? You have to do surveys about public participation, uh, have methodology on whether the community even wants it, you know. Those are the kinds of things that you write in a proposal. The long-term vision. Many projects that are funded in public health are three to five years. Because that's the funding cycle that funding agencies have. So we expect that you include things like the budget. What specific activities are you planning uh, to use the money for? If you're doing a survey, you have to include the survey instrument, even if it's a draft. Here are the questions I want to ask people. Here's the goal that I'm uh, leading uh, to. So um, we will work on with you on, on the grant proposal, I think, until the final version is due uh, in, in June. And then, of course, that's the uh, final period for the course. And in the last uh, requirement, um, would expect that you capture your project and your writing assignments and your career objectives, all of the things I talked about in terms of the learning objectives in a PowerPoint presentation that you will be able to come in front of the class and spend three minutes to talk about what you have accomplished uh, during the quarter. For most students, if you stick with a topic, this is a very straightforward thing. Um, let's pretend again, as I began talking today, that your, your practicum site is the Latino Health Access in Santana. And you're involved in a wellness project. And we had somebody tell us a little bit about diabetes. So the goal of your project with Latino Health Access is to reduce the incidence of diabetes, childhood diabetes, or gestational diabetes, whatever it is, in Santana, 
through the creation of this wellness uh, corridor, you might start by the public writing, Google News, Diabetes in Santana, or Wellness Corridor. What was written about it recently? I'm sure you'll find some. You write an opinion about that, 500 people. You may not respond to something that's already published. You may simply write 500 words to Orange County Register <coughs> saying, I want the community to know about this project. So you initiate the discussion by writing an opinion for the newspaper. Here's what I think about the Wellness Corridor Project in Santana. They're not doing it right, or they missed the point, or it's not going to have an effect. You express your opinion. That's original. Most newspapers like that. Nothing's been written about it before. Here's someone saying, you know, the important thing, they'll publish it. The scholarly review. You think, okay, why is that it is prevalent in this particular part of Orange County? We can look at the Orange County uh, Healthy People, Healthy Places document. It's like a 300 page full of maps. Health disparities all over the place. Okay, if you look at the map of the county and the incidence of gestational diabetes, you'll know that it's different if you're living southern Orange County versus eastern versus northern or the coastal region. Why, are, why do we have those disparities? Well, it may be if you do Google Scholar, you'd find data uh, or publications that are focused on socioeconomic status and diabetes incidence. You read that paper carefully, you find additional papers, you begin to review what do we know about the connection between socioeconomic status and diabetes. Not just in Santana, but in general. And then, finally, you write it, you know, your thoughts have, you know, percolated. Then you say, well, I think we can do something like this. What agencies will give money for that kind of project? You target them, you bring all of your thoughts and ideas together into presentation. If you give us this money, we'll build this program or this infrastructure, more nutritional food, more exercising, more counseling, behavior modification, whatever it is. Here are the methods we'll use, and we can assure you that if you give us that money, within five years, we will make a dent on the prevalence of diabetes in the country. So if you stick with one topic, you can complete the right assignment. Um, I've, in, when I taught these courses, it's been a while now, I used to say, well, if you change your mind after writing the op-ed article and you find out, well, I'm not really interested in that anymore, you can switch. You can do it, but it takes a lot more time and energy to put into the next phase of the writing. Because you'd have to do the background uh, research all over again. Okay. So that's uh, very, very important in terms of you know, what we expect for you to pass the course. Uh, the, the grades are consistent across all of the professors who teach the course so of the 200 points, you know, we expect that if you're doing very well, um, you know, A is not that hard to, to get. Um, I don't know, I know people have failed the course, but if you don't show up or you at your practicum site or you don't come to class, don't submit assignments, <coughs> You know, that's very, you get a zero. If you caught plagiarizing, things like that will cost you a lot. And it's not necessary because this course is meant to help you develop those skills. Are there questions about the expectations for the assignments or the grading? Okay, very clear. So, um, just very quickly, um, so you can get started. Some of you have already uh, gone to your practicum sites, maybe others have not. That first assignment, you can add more to these questions, but this is the minimum I would like to be able to read in your responses. So you ask your preceptor, what are the goals and objectives of the organization? What are the major challenges? 
and what are the approaches being used to solve the challenges? Some, um, for some students, and I recommend this for all of you, it's a good idea to break the ice by beginning with asking your preceptor to tell you about him or herself. How, what training did you have? How did you come up with this to, to work here? And you know, how long have you been working there? And what projects have you worked on? Then you get into it. From now on, what are the goals and objectives and challenges? And so that, that smooths the conversation uh, very, very nicely. Um, sources for writing for the public. These are useful guidelines uh, that I've pulled off from major newspapers, from the Registrar, the Times, New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle. They all publish their expectations. So you have to tell us what newspaper or magazine you are targeting, and you try to write consistently with their format. But it has to be at least 500 words. For the scholarly review, uh, our the journal for our discipline is the American Journal of Public Health. So I expect that you're all familiar with that. Um, click on it, look at the uh, series of publications. Uh, UCI subscribes to it, so it's free to access articles. Um, they have a section on instruction for authors. It's a little dense, but it doesn't hurt to read it at least once. Uh, that's it. It's an international journal, but primarily American authors. The Bulletin of the World Health Organization is a very uh, international journal. Authors from all over the world, editors from all over the world. Also excellent. Archives of Public Health, uh, uh, BMC Public Health, Environmental Health Perspectives. Uh, lots of journals in epidemiology, social and behavioral health. But these are just examples of where you can go um, access additional publications after you do that initial Google Scholar, right? So there are more than 100 public health journals. This link goes to an archive of different journals in different fields of public health. And then uh, sources for grant proposal writing. Our best friend, if you will, in terms of research and grants is the National Institute of Health. They spend more money on grants than any other federal agency to uh, deal with public health problems. And they have a section on training, which are appropriate for undergraduates who are going on to graduate school or professional training. And you can actually turn your grant proposal at the end of this course. If you're looking forward to a graduate career or medical school training into a proposal that will be funded as a fellowship. I've had many of my students apply to those kinds of fellowships and a few win it, but it's a very great accomplishment if you do it. Nothing wrong with trying. Uh, the grant guide is very long and dense. Certain sections of it, like human subjects, so if you're including human subjects in your proposal, uh, you'll find um, uh, resources at that uh, link. So, um, I uh, next week we will have a guest, present, a guest to present to us on how you can use the library more effectively. Her name is Bethany Aris, and uh, she will uh, talk to us, I think, will come at 2.30 p.m. to kind of uh, give you another primer on, on the writing assignments that I outlined. Uh, and uh, so what we'll have next before we go into just brief discussions about your practicum sites, the person who facilitated all of these sites, I can't believe how much work this is for you, Stephanie, but. Uh, she's here. Please welcome uh, Ms. Stephanie Leonard, who you have all uh, <laughs> We'll just go over a few things. Um, what's going to make it successful for you guys at your practicum site? Some things you kind of want to avoid, um, and then how you really can just take advantage of this opportunity. We're one of the few majors that requires you guys to do this, and well, 
may not seem like the funnest thing in the world to start right now, it's hugely beneficial for you. The fact that you're going to graduate with some public health experience on your resume is going to make you extremely marketable. So take advantage of this as much as you can. It's a great opportunity. Certain expectations you want with week one right now, start it off with a good foot. Um, hopefully by now you've established your schedule with your site and supervisor. Really make sure that you accommodate them as much as possible. They do realize you guys are students and your first priority is to be a student and to pass your classes, but they are businesses. They do have to function during certain hours. So try to accommodate that as much as possible. It's always been able to work out with sites in the past. So don't hesitate to ask them if you need it to be moved around a little bit or whatnot. Be really aware of all of the expectations your site and supervisor has for you. Hopefully they've gone over what they expect and what they want from you, but if you are unclear at all, be sure to ask them. I deal with all of the supervisors, I know them all personally, and they're very nice people. They might seem intimidating, but they're all very nice and they love having UC Irvine students come. Then as Deli has mentioned, you also need to be attending your weekly sessions of class. That's extremely important. So don't forget that. This first week is so important because it's your first impression besides your interview when they originally decided that they really liked you and wanted to hire you. So keep it going strong. Keep that solid connection established and follow through with anything that you have already determined you're going to do for them or told them you're going to do for them. There's always room to grow if something doesn't go well the very first time, but learn from your mistake and move on. If you need any time off, be sure to tell your supervisor in the beginning. If you're going to be gone for a week, let them know. Let them know off the bat so that they can expect that they need to work around that. If there's any other special accommodations that you might need, um, of course, only the necessary ones, but be sure to talk to them about this as well. They're very accommodating people. Anything else that's important as well, be sure to mention. They, they are here to help you grow as well and contribute to your success in this first practicum experience. Please, please treat practicum like a job. It should be treated like a job. It's exciting. You guys are getting great work experience. Hopefully everyone walks away with this with great stories and great experience. But this is a job and it should be treated like one. It's anything that you would do when you're getting paid, do it here. Um, a few of these sites on here are just some of the over 190 that we have. And every time I hear about how an internship is changing or evolving or anytime we add a new site to the catalog, it just sounds so exciting and something that is really great for you guys to be a part of. So take it very seriously. Um, treat it exactly like you would a paid job. All right, some questions you may want to ask when you start working there. You know, is there a dress code? How do you log your hours? Who do you call, email if you're sick or something's come up? Make sure you establish all of this. You don't want to create that first impression, come in in a tank top, and then they expect you to be in a collared button-down shirt. Just be aware of everything that you guys need. Anything you need clarification on, just be sure to ask. Um, again, hopefully you already know some of this stuff by now, but if not, it does not hurt to ask. We also, I don't require you to log your hours with a form that we have. How I confirm your hours is by each site at the end of the quarter and they've had you guys log your hours and they've kept track of it. Um, so there isn't something you need to turn into us, but there will be something you need to turn into your supervisor. So just be sure to have that in and know what that is so that they can track your hours as well so that at the end of the quarter you get credit for that. Your overall behavior during this entire quarter is just, like I said, as professional as possible. Take full responsibility for tasks assigned to you. If someone assigns something to you and you kind of halfway do it, that is your assignment. Complete the whole thing. Make sure you know what you're doing. Give it 110%. Be sure to respect your supervisor's space. Um, you know, they are your boss, so treat them as as one. Respect their office space materials. You know, don't go in their office if they haven't asked you to. Don't move things around if, if they haven't said to. Just be respectful of that. 
Again, any questions, if you need clarification from them, are always key. And it's always wise to just periodically ask your supervisor, how are you doing? What can you improve? Is there anything else you should be working on? Are you meeting their expectations? Supervisors love this. It's always great that they know you're aware of what you're doing and you want feedback, that you're concerned about your performance. It's important for you to do well. So, you know, if you ask them every once in a while what else you should be doing or if you're doing a good job, they're happy to give you feedback for that and happy to have you ask it. If throughout the quarter any concerns come up from any of you, the sooner you come see me, the better. Email, call, come in. I'm hopefully very accessible and I respond to email 24 hours a day. So if you ever need to discuss something with me, feel free to. Um, this doesn't necessarily include complaints about entry level work. Although copying may not be the, the best task in the world, it is something that everyone has to do in their job. I've done it in every single one of mine and probably will forever have to. So that is something that, while it may not be fun, it is probably going to be a part of your job. I don't want it to be the full extent of your job, but it will be a part of it. <coughs> if the concern is something that you would like to be kept confidential, most of them can be kept confidential. So this is something that if you need to come talk to me just about a concern, come see me. The earlier you do, the better that we can solve it, that we can fix it, or that we can uh, move you if that is what is necessary. So now, once you get to the middle of the quarter, expectations are still there, but this is where you really want to be sure that you're still maintaining everything. You're still coming when you say you're going to. You're punctual. You know, if you ever need to be late, things happen. There is traffic. You know, we live in California. Then let them know. But just be punctual as much as you can. You want to still be interacting respectfully with your supervisors and colleagues. Probably some of you guys are at sites where there's more than one of you. Um, Always be sure to be just as respectful to your fellow students as you would be to your supervisor. You're going to learn just as much from each other as you will from the site. You want to exert maximum effort in completing tasks and assignments. Once again, follow through. Just be sure to complete anything that's asked of you. Uphold the level of prof professionalism and always seek and accept feedback from your supervisor. And then the last one, which is extremely key, turn in all your assignments and attend all practicum class sessions. The beginning of the quarter, it's great, you start off fresh, everything's great. And this is when, in the middle of the quarter, you start losing steam. You can't in this class. Unfortunately, if you don't pass the class with a C or better, you do have to repeat it. And I promise you, Delhi is going to be the best professor that you have. So take advantage of it while you can. I know Delhi has gone over a lot of this, so I'll briefly go through it. You really want to be sure to visit the Center for Excellence in Writing and Communication. It used to be called just the Center for Writing, the Writing Center, um, but it has changed names. They offer a free review service, and they've really modified to accommodate for students. There's online help. There's online appointment scheduling. They have nighttime hours. They've even got some online weekend hours. It's in the Ayala Science Library, and I had a professor even come in today talking to me about how if they were to be writing papers anytime soon, they would probably go there to have them reviewed. And this professor had 20 plus experience years on them. Um, it's an extremely helpful resource and it's something that it's just going to take an hour out of your day to go down there and have someone review it. And not only are they going to help you with a better grade, they're really going to help you learn how to become an effective writer. So this is something that's a great UCI resource. Um, if you need to find this link later on and you can't find it, just go to uci.edu and type in Writing Center and it's the first, first link that pops up. Some more resources again are your TA and of course Delhi, but attend their office hours when you have questions. Ask for feedback on your papers. They're the ones that are helping determine your grade, so help get the help from them and, and determine what they're looking for. If you can have your peers critique your work, that's also extremely helpful before you submit something. But ask for honest feedback. Don't give your paper to your best friend who's going to say that it's fantastic and you look really good today too. And Pick someone who's going to be brutally honest with you that will give you that constructive feedback. That is sometimes not fun, but it's what helps. So be sure to go to the right person. 
by the end of the quarter. The expectations are, are what's listed and they're all very strict. So it is completion of all 100 hours. Even if you do 99, you have to retake the class. It is 100. I track down every single student hours and make sure that this is what has happened. So it is something that we check. It is something that you just want to follow through with. There are a few times where students have passed the course, but they didn't complete their hours, and they have to take the course all over again and do new hours. So it's not worth it to not complete it. You also want to maintain great attendance and punctuality still at this point. You want to have completed all of your practicum assignments, completed your sit-down evaluation with your supervisor, which I'll go over more in a second here, and completion of your site survey. If you do all of these things, you'll pass the course. And if you do them well, well, if you do them all well, you'll pass the course. But if you really put some effort into it, this, this is a great course to really learn from and succeed and help you with what you do after you graduate. So I know Deli touched on this a little bit too, but I really need to stress this because it's something that we see all the time, um, and especially in a writing-based course. Academic dishonesty. So most students, when they think of academic dishonesty, you think of cheating, you think of looking off each other's tests, you know, getting an old test, bringing in your blue book with answers in it. <clears throat> those, those types of cheating that aren't really necessarily applicable to this course since there aren't tests. Um, but obviously are still very applicable. All of this is taken from UCI's website, so this is their policy and we enforce it. We're very strict about it. But what is specific to practicum is plagiarism. It is something that I think a lot of confusion surrounds because you don't maybe think you know, you've gotten a quote off of a website and you didn't cite it properly. You're not meaning to plagiarize it but it is plagiarism, and it can result in a fail from the course. You just want to be safe. This is, again, where the writing center is going to help you. They can tell you, you didn't cite this correctly. This isn't right. You need to be careful about this. This is going to get you in trouble. Um, they are a great resource for that as well. The two forms, two main forms of plagiarism are to steal or pass off one's own Oh, to steal or pass off as one's own the ideas or words, images, or other creative works of another, to use a creative production without crediting the source, even if only minimal information is available to identify it for citation. You have to give credit for every single quotation, <coughs> anything, pictures, anything that you put into a work that you're creating. Give them credit for it. The other thing that we see from time to time once we submit these papers to turnitin.com, they pop up. If, if it's red, it's bad. And when there's chunks of red, it means students have just copied full paragraphs from something. That's not acceptable either. It kind of doesn't even matter if you source it at that point. I mean, it does. At least you're not fully plagiarizing, but that's not acceptable either. Just don't get yourself into any of that, into those situations. Along the same lines, be really careful about dishonest behavior. You are dealing with sites, so you are off campus, you're representing UC Irvine. Don't go to the site and take anything home with you. Um, unless your supervisor has specifically asked you to take something home, which rarely will ever happen, if not ever, do not take anything home. Um, leave everything at the work site. If you are t told to be taking something home, just be very clear that you've been told this. Please do not steal from your site at all. This includes things that some students or some people just wouldn't even think about. You know, taking a ream of paper home for your computer at home, that's stealing. Um, just please do not do that. It also includes intellectual property. If you are taking home some confidential research ideas that you've learned from them, most of you, if you're in this situation, will have signed confidentiality agreements. But please don't, don't try to take any of that with you as well. It's something you're learning from and growing from, but not something that is your own that is something that you can use in the future unless <coughs> authorized to. And please don't lie about your hours, your assignments. Don't come in and sign another student's name for attendance. We do find this. So this is all stuff that we really don't like finding, but we do. So just be really careful. If you ever have any questions about any of it, if you're concerned because the supervisor has told you to take something home, let me know. You know, I am always happy to answer any questions about any of these things. And like I said, if you know of any of this happening and you're concerned about it, 
I'm here to meet with you at any time. The consequences are very harsh and they happen. Um, you will most likely fail the assignment. You could fail the course. Most likely you will, depending on the weight of the assignment. You'll have a letter of academic dishonesty on your record that follows you. You could be disqualified from the public health program if the offense is severe enough. And like I said, you'll have to repeat the course, complete new assignments and new hours. And you have a great opportunity with Delhi here, so take advantage of it. Bottom line, it's just not worth it. Um, things get submitted on turnitin.com. You probably have all already know about this, so these are just some quick facts about it. It catches everything. It is kind of amazing how it works, but everything gets submitted there, and it just catches it in about, I think, 13 seconds, they said, was the average time it caught things. So just be careful. And again, if you have any questions about plagiarism, citation, talk to, talk to Deli, talk to your TAs, ask me. We're all here to help you. Some important dates that you want to keep in mind, one of them being April 1st, Hopefully you have started your hours or you know when you're starting your hours. Like I said, if, it's a, if you're unsure at all, contact your supervisor today to set that up. The 100 hours can really creep up on you. You want to be doing about 10 hours a week. And of course, it does depend on the site that you're working for and if they have any special events, things like that. But just stay on top. Try to maintain about 10 hours a week. It does catch up if you don't stay on top of it. By June 7th, all 100 hours must be completed. That same date your evaluations from your supervisor are due. I email all the supervisors with the evaluation. I definitely bug them as well to get them in, but it is your responsibility to make sure that they have it in. If I get close to that date and I don't have it from you, I will start emailing you asking you to stay on top of it as well. That is dependent on your grade, so it's very important for you guys to be on top of it too. Again, all 100 hours, there are no extensions. Zero, none given. Um, you'd have to be in a pretty special circumstance to get an extension granted, and so far we've never granted one, so keep that in mind. And again, if you don't complete all 100 hours, it does result in a fail in the course and you have to repeat it. If an emergency does come up, we realize these things happen, see me as soon as possible. We will work something out, but you have to see me when it happens, not weeks later when you're drowning because you haven't completed half of your hours and it's, it's D-Day. Okay. The other more important, in, the other really important thing, besides your hours, for in terms of the site, is your supervisor evaluation. It gives your supervisor a chance to sit down with you and really critique what you've done over the quarter. This is great feedback. This is something that you'll have to go through on a much scarier level once you're in the working world, because then it that evaluation will depend on if you get to keep your job, if you get raised, if you're getting demoted, all those things. So this is a really great opportunity to kind of really sit down with your supervisor, ask them questions. They will go over the form with you and kind of let you know how you did. If the evaluations do come back badly, if they're poor, it could affect your grade. So this isn't something that's necessarily easy to determine, but if we have them come back and they're really bad, you will not pass the course. So again, just really give it your all. Um, and let me know if there are any conflicts that arise. And again, your evaluations are due Friday, June 7th, 5 p.m. And I will keep on top of all of it to help you guys make sure that they're in. I know it's really hard to see this, but this is what the evaluation looks like. In the top box is where your supervisor will write all the hours that you did. If you do more than 100, make sure that they write all the hours, not just 100 plus. You know, it's good to have that on file if you guys if you need it later on for job reference, you know, your resume, whatever it might be. And then this box down here is kind of where you get ranked. And then up above and down below with an appendix if they want to expand on specifics, which they typically always do. Is there a question? Yes. Uh, do they just need to write down like how many hours total or do they need like a weekly no, so this is where you just want to make sure that says 100 or 100 plus or exact hours because this is, this is where you want to make sure you know what you're supposed to do with your supervisor when logging your hours. I don't require you to turn them in weekly for me, but your supervisor will have some sort of a system. Either you go and you, you know, clock in or they have a book that you sign or there's an electronic system. There's going to be some sort of way that they're going to help you track your hours. There are forms that I give them, some, some of them, that 
our UCI forms for tracking hours. So that could be something they give you, but that's not something I required. They just track that. They're responsible for confirming your hours with you. But again, just when you sit down with your supervisor, if any questions pop up about this, if there is an area that they haven't ranked you what you thought you would get ranked, ask them why. It's so great to get that constructive feedback, especially while you're about to graduate. You know, any weakness isn't something that can stay a weakness unless you really, if, unless you ignore it. So try to find those out and see where you can improve and, and what will work best for you to really be successful once you get out there in the working world. The site evaluation that is um, on your syllabus as well. It is a chance for you guys to get feedback on the sites. Please be detailed. These things are very important. We use them for many different purposes. One of them being so that I can make sure the sites are having effective internships and that what I've been told you guys are going to do, you're doing. Um, so on that level, they're very important so that we maintain the quality of the internships. And they're also helpful for us because we do award um, the sites at the end of the year, the, one, the really excellent ones. You know, some of the supervisors that are really outstanding. There are some really great sites that do amazing things. And we really want to pay them back for what they've done for us and for our students. So just be as detailed about the sites as possible. Good, bad, whatever it might be. Again, no complaints about copying. Unless, again, it is only what you did. But... Um, just try to give as much feedback as you can. They are very helpful for everyone. With that, all I can say is really have fun with your internship. It's such a great experience. We've had sites hire our students after they've graduated. Um, and if they haven't hired them, they've networked them with other sites. If you are ever thinking about applying for graduate programs, med school, whatever it might be, really develop a strong relationship with your supervisor. They will have a great letter of recommendation for you when you're finished, if that's the case. And if you can have a letter of recommendation from a, a work employer, that's great, and especially a really great one. So just keep in mind all of these things and have a lot of fun. And again, if anything comes up, just be sure to come see me as soon as you can. I have cards up here, too, in case anyone needs um, my information. So. I'd like you to tell us um, what about the site appeal to you. Sometimes that may just be the only site available. That's OK. You can say so. Uh, a little bit about your expectations. At the end of the quarter, one of the slides that I will require that you put up is whether or not, uh, after the whole thing is over, these expectations were met or not. Okay. So this is a before, and at the end of the quarter we'll have an after. Not that I'll memorize what everybody says, but I'd like you to kind of think about, you know, what are you looking forward to accomplishing at this particular uh, site? Um, the first person to talk about a particular site should tell us a little bit more about the functions of the organization. If you are a second um, student that we call on um, at the same site, you don't need to go into the details about the organization again, unless you have something additional that you want to share. Uh, but you should all say something about your uh, what appeals to you about the site, what your expectations are, and what your career goals are. Okay? So at the minimum, three things. It should take less than a minute. Okay? Um, so, uh, Brenda. Yes? Right here. Okay. Um, um, You're forced. Huh? You're forced. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Um, my site is a UCI Children's Center, and um, it's basically like a daycare center for um, kids of UCI staff or um, graduate students. And um, nothing wrong with the kids in terms of health. There's no, they just they're all healthy children. Uh yeah okay. yeah they're 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 a really diverse group and um, they all they they all look healthy and. They stay active most of the day. Is there any research going on at the center, like child development? Um, 
maybe you don't not know that yet. Not that I'm fully okay. aware, right. but I've seen um, other UCI students come for research purposes. Right. Yeah. You may learn more about that. I think typically there's some development project, you know, autism type stuff that goes on. Okay, what appealed to you? Um, the environment itself, it, it's really friendly, and the kids, they're a pretty smart group. And um, What age groups? Uh, from two to like four and a half. Okay. Yeah. Preschool. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <coughs> Did you already forgot the two, three things? Go ahead. Oh, and uh, uh, what appealed to you? Your expectations mm -hmm. of what you're gonna learn, accomplish, and how does it fit or doesn't fit your career goals? Um, what appealed to me was uh, the, the the environment and um, the diversity of kids and like the acceptance of the diversity from mm -hmm. the staff. And you, when you say diversity in public health, you have to qualify that. Ethnic diversity, biological, gender. Um, honestly, more like, like social and ethnic uh, okay, diversity. So yeah. should, okay, social. And my expectations are to learn more of like the, honestly, the cognitive development of the kids mm -hmm. from when they start early on, when they, as they, as they um, like develop more. And also, they're, I want to see more of the physical state being off too. And my future uh, goals are either medical school or graduate school in public health. Okay. Thank you. So I called you Brenda. If I call you a name that you'd rather not be called, well, I don't know if you go by Susanna or Brenda. Brenda. Brenda, okay. So I'm going to do that with everybody, but feel free to tell us your preference. This is how I um, also get to know people by face and name. Okay, uh, Jenny? Yeah. Um, I'm a child life intern at UC Irvine Medical Center. So we work with the pediatric patients and their siblings at like the bedside in the play room and kind of provide support for them and um, their families as they like cope with like the hospital. So these are, these are children under the age of 16 who um, have health problems? Children from like infant to like 18. Mm -hmm. And then, so a lot of the patients, like, they either, like, have, like, trauma traumatic accidents or, like, um, burns, so in the burn center. Um, what appealed to me about it was that you get to work with, like, kids and you get more experience in, like, the hospital. And it fits with my career goals because I'm hoping to become a physician assistant, hopefully in pediatrics. So mm -hmm. I hope to, like, learn more about what it's really like to be in the medical field and, like, being in the hospital setting. So what kind of training do physician assistants Get. Is it all graduate or can you get a bachelor's in? Um, for physician assistants, um, a lot of them are switching to master's degrees. Mm -hmm. So you need at least like two years of paid healthcare experience or volunteering. And then you have to apply to graduate school, which is about like two years. Right, right. And do you have preference for where, what institution you would um, apply to? Where I can get in. No, that's not. <laughs> you just have to set high standards. Um, <laughs> if I could choose uh, USC or Cornell in New York City. Yeah, okay. Good, thank you. Okay, Sheena? There you um, are. I'm an intern at Urban Child Development Center. Okay. And what I found most appealing is that I love kids and I love working with kids, so I thought it would be a good experience. And um, my favorite is I just want to learn more about child development. And um, how to work, get more experience working with children. And it's, it's basically like infants to like children under four. Oh. And um, I want to be a PA as well. So um, basically going uh, into pediatrics, mm -hmm. assistant or not. And so I think it would be a good So the Child Development Center is at uh, where we call North Campus? Um, actually, it's on um, Jamboree or, or Makato? Oh yeah, Irvine Civic Center. Yeah. Okay. So it's right there. So and and these children are all normal. Um, some of them are not. There's no normal actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so are, are they? It, it's a diverse group. Um, yeah. There's some with disabilities. And some with okay. And do they assign you to a particular <coughs> teacher in the classroom, or do you um, get to yeah, go around? I'll, I'll get um, to different classrooms each, each time I go. Okay. 
One of the things I recommend is to keep a, a diary, a log, not just for time, like a diary every time you go, you know, what did you do today? Um, we don't require that to turn it in, but it helps you organize your thoughts as you pro progress through the course. Okay. Uh, Ryan. Um, I'm interning at Swast Solutions Dentistry, um, and uh, what appealed to me is because I want to uh, hopefully become a, a dentist uh -huh. in the future. And um, in regards to my uh, supervisor, I want to kind of gain uh, more of a mentor as well. Uh, uh, Throughout my journey of trying to be a dentist. Yeah, um, so you, that's pretty focused. You, you already mm -hmm. uh, picked a dental school. When we started public health at UC Irvine, this was a town hall meeting was called to discuss what kinds of health professions we wanted. Mm -hmm. And for maybe 10 seconds, people talked about a school of dentistry. And then we put pharmacy and nursing and uh, came up at the same time and public health kind of started. But in the UC system, are there dental dentistry schools? Uh, there's a LA. UCLA has a dentistry program. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the goals? Um, maybe not LA, but hopefully somewhere maybe up north. Um, okay. Probably San Francisco has something. All right. Thank you. Uh, Crystal. Yeah. There you are. The Botox company. Yeah, uh, doing Botox. Yes. Yeah. And so I work under the RCDM department, which is a regulatory documents and contracts management. <coughs> we make sure that um, basically we're getting the right documents from the physicians that are participating in the case studies. And um, what appealed to me was that it was a big name company, and I was really interested in getting into the pharmaceutical field. And expectations is, um, I just want to know about um, uh, development and like, ensuring the safety and compliance mm -hmm. between like, the doctors and the patients and the company. Several of our graduates work for the epidemiology division, but you're in a different division, right? Yeah, I, talked, I went to one of the public health um, seminars mm -hmm. by Dr. Aubrey Aubrey Manak, yeah. yeah we have. A, yeah, she gave a presentation on Botox. Right. We have a, a video tape of, of a presentation that she gave here. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, we're hoping one person will come speak, uh, maybe a preceptor. We we don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Talene. Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm interning at the American Heart Association under health fairs. Mm -hmm. uh, the side appeal to me because um, I have a lot of relatives and people that I love that have heart conditions. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to help promote a healthier lifestyle and get the word out there. Um, I expect to learn a lot because it's a nonprofit. So, so far I've learned, a, like I've been into volunteering there since last quarter. So I've learned a lot already. Um, and in the future I want to go into into health admin. Mm -hmm. um, do they get most of their money for, they don't, from writing grants? They don't yeah. have like a, yeah, it's non-profit. And they have a day or a week a year where they have a big event, yeah. fundraising and awareness? Yeah, okay. exactly. So it, you've been there already? Yeah. What did you do the, the first day? Uh, so far I've been uh, help set up, setting up Vendors would contact us to help to go to their um, expos and present material to them. Like we usually come with um, paperwork and give them information about healthier lifestyles, promoting exercise, mm -hmm. or like what cardiovascular disease is and stuff like that. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Hello, uh, yeah. Becky. Um, Becky. I'm yes. at the UCI LGT Center, mm -hmm. and. I, didn't, I don't have like specific duties, but she wants her interns to bring something different to the center. So I'm working on building an ally relationship with the Greek system. So I'm going to make my own things for both the other two centers that like promotes the Greek system. As in Delta, Delta, Delta? 
on your shirt? Is that yeah? yeah. <laughs> what what I, 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 what appealed to you to to pick that site? Was that that? Um, yeah, it was my first choice. It was the only one I really wanted to work at. It's okay. Something LGBT rights, something I'm really passionate yeah. about. Yeah, um, today Public Health donated to the Memorial Fund of a, an unfortunate event, the person who died recently. Um, so we're establishing a fund and it will support these kinds of activities. I'm pretty sure the center will be involved in how uh, it's to provide support for people who have worked in this field. So it will be announced shortly, I believe. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you, you are, you're expected to kind of bring something new to their programs, and um, do you already have, you said you're working with the relationship with the, the fraternities and the sororities, was that yeah. my understanding? And that's your idea or something they had already? Yeah, something that they're lacking. Okay. Really All right. Thank you. So at the end of the quarter, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, did, did it get implemented? And did, was it according to what you were thinking? Okay. Uh, Brianna. Hi. Um, I work at Vitaly Corporate Services. Um, what appealed to me about that is health and wellness isn't not only a, a field of interest for me, but it's a hobby. Um, and it's something I'm passionate about. So when I learned about Vitaly, um, they provide health um, lifestyle wellness programs for the workplace, mm -hmm. um, which is something I think is important um, because people need to be healthy at work as well as at home. <laughs> uh, so I love that idea that they promote healthy life um, in trying to improve the quality of life of everybody. Um, what was the other question? Um, well, let's, so do they like take contracts with employers and then go there to implement? Yeah, so they, so they so have, have clients. Um, clients uh, and they implement the programs. Well, we already know what appealed to you, mm -hmm. but what, what are your expectations? For okay, so I expect to learn about the types of programs that they offer um, and how they help. Um, they do a lot of data analysis mm -hmm. um, based on their programs, so I want to see how effective and successful they are and maybe learn about possible new programs that can be created um, and how it's, yeah, just how it's helping and your career goals? Sorry. Oh, Car my career goals. I want it. I would love to do something exactly like that. Did, whether it's with Vitaly or another company, um, something that has to do with wellness and mm -hmm. lifestyle. Changes. Good. Becca didn't tell us about her career goals. Uh, I want to go into Petroleum nursing. I'm sorry. Petroleum and Petroleum. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, physician. I'm going to nursing school. After this. Okay, nursing school. Wonderful. All right, uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, okay, not here today. Uh, Raven. Perfect. Okay, hi, Raven. Um, I work at the UCI Medical Center through the OBGYN department, uh -huh. which um, I came, I'm interested in that because I want to be a physician in OBGYN uh -huh. as well. Um, so what our uh, department kind of does, we're like the backbone of the resident, the medical students there. Mm -hmm. They're actually working in the, the gyne uh, gynecology department and also the obstetrics department. Um, so we make sure that the, um, the medical students are scheduled to work at certain times and we also have to um, coordinate their lectures. So with the physicians there that are telling about, about the new innovative things mm -hmm. that are going on in medicine. Um, what I expect to learn is um, to also kind of collaborate with some of the doctors there hopefully and learn some new innovative things that also kind of uh, help with your application to medical school. Yes, yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah. well, um, have you met Dr. Phil Desire? No. Yeah, he used to direct the, the whole program. He's a very senior professor there. Um, okay, do you have uh, narrowed down where medical schools you'd like to go? Um, I was hoping Emory is one of my schools. Which one? Emory. Emory. Mm -hmm. Emory. Great school, right next to CDC. Mm -hmm. um, have you taken MCAT? No, not yet. Okay, focus on, on getting good grades, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, pa uh, Paige. Paige is also at Human Resources. Jeffrey was not here. Paige is not here either. 
we have to call the human resources person. <laughs> okay. Uh, Victoria. Victoria? Out here. Uh, Christiana. Another vi vital. Um, hi, I'm Christiana. I'm also working with Rihanna uh -huh. at um, Vitality. And I pretty much chose the site because I'm interested in like, the business side and also health. So kind of like combining that is very interesting to me. And I think it's really important because um, I think in order to do well at your job, you have to be in good health, you know? Like I think it really influences um, how you do stuff. So um, I'm really interested in that. And I get to follow a registered dietitian around. So I also get to see how she develops programs and stuff. So. Sorry. I'm listening. Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> Someone's out the door. Um, so, did you say where you were headed after um, graduation? I'm not positive, but I'm thinking like healthcare management policy. So like an MPH in healthcare management or like Paul Merai <laughs> School of Business, healthcare administration, big box. Mm -hmm. um, that's an increasingly important area of work because we have all kinds of policies that need to be implemented and my just ex especially with the, with the Affordable Care Act. Um, there's a lot of need in terms of workforce. Okay, uh, and probably for tertiary agencies like Vitaly to do more prevention. That's really the goal. Okay, Stephanie? Early childhood, okay. Um, I'm just interested in like seeing uh, child development and also on the other hand, I want to go into IoT with children or on the other hand, I want to work more with school management too. These are two different. Yes, yeah, two entirely different. Do you, do you see what you're doing now as maybe helpful in making that decision for you by the end? Um, in the OT field, I guess in observing the children, there's only one child that I've met that does have all <coughs> So, I mean, it gives me some experience, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you had said something about what you'd like to, what, what kind of degrees are you thinking? Or do you think you might be able to get employment in these fields with your bachelor's degree? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Miracles for Kids. Um, so, uh, Miracles for Kids is an organization where they uh, raise money and support families who have children with pediatric illnesses and cancer. Um, they also fund research for it too. And I think what really appealed to me was just their cause. And it's, it's in a very small office, mm -hmm. but there's the people that I've been able to like interact with and talk to, they're really passionate about what they do. And I think that's really amazing. And um, I think uh, I actually want to go into physical therapy. So this doesn't really relate to what I do, but I think it's something that I want to stay involved in even <coughs> after, because just, uh, just to be involved with the community Right. More. And they they have a lot of programs throughout the year. They just finished one, um, like the, I think like two weekends ago. It was a spring basket, like cherry kind of thing. So they like auctioned off baskets, and they're able to get a lot of um, like money from that. Yeah, they do uh, fundraising. Have they um, told you about other ways of raising funds, like writing grant proposals to? No, they do that too, but that's not what I'm interning for. They have yeah. they have like development interns and program interns. So I'm more involved with. Organizing the programs. Okay. Um, an upcoming event they have is in the summer. It's like a paddling event for mm -hmm. the kids to come out to. And, yeah. Good. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Uh, Devin. That's me. Okay. Um, I'm working at Girls Inc. It's a nonprofit where the girls come in after school. It's like an after school program. And they're there from like usually 1 to 6. And <coughs> we go there and we help them out with their homework or anything and then we have like class time which they teach them different 
subjects like yesterday I helped with self-defense class and just like teaching girls how to be more independent and everything. And that really appealed to me because I think that's very important just to teach Is there them. anything um, that separates these girls who enroll in this program from well, other? Yeah, it's in Costa Mesa, so it's kind of not a really great neighborhood. So it kind of gets them off the streets and something yeah. to do. How does it relate to your, well, your expectations for what you're doing? expectations. Um, I just kind of want to see how, like, going to a place like this can change their lives, like, or how I can help these girls, like, with my experiences and what I've been through, like, help kind of be a role model to them. Mm -hmm. And then in the future, I want to go to nursing school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, what you described is, um, what social work degree gets, that's what they do, but that doesn't appeal to you. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, the other Jeffrey. Jeffrey, all the Jeffreys <laughs> are gone today. Okay. Uh, Tuong, another, maybe the wellness people are having a meeting right now. Uh, Tuong? Vietnamese uh, American Cancer Foundation, not, not here? So, oh, you're here. <laughs> so I'm interning at the Vietnamese American Cancer Foundation, and I choose to work there because they have a lot of events that help out like minorities, mm -hmm. and I thought it was interesting, like, you want to help out other people. Where, where is this located? Where is uh, Mountain Valley. Mm -hmm. And then for my future, I want to be a PA. A physician assistant. There's a lot of money in it, but why Why not? Those who want to do a PA, I, um, it's a growing field, but why not go to medical school? There's less commitment. Less commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever say that to, to an interview. <laughs> What is time, money? What what is well, what are you like, short? I interned at the hospital before, and the, like you see how like hard it is to get into the doctor. Yeah, and the the pace of life for a yeah, physician, you think it's lifestyle. yeah. Okay. Uh, Soham. Oops. I'm so hot. Yeah. So, I... Did I say it correctly? Soham? No. Soha. Soha. S-O-H-A. Okay. Yeah. So I'm doing my internship at the UCI Veteran Center here on campus. Um, it doesn't really... really um, so well, what we work on are like programs for like tobacco cessation for students on campus. And then what I'm working on specifically is the UCI annual veteran appreciation dean. Mm -hmm. So the dean will be there. So what I do is like I contact restaurants or organizations for like um, donations or um, basically organize the whole event. And my interests aren't really related to what I work with, but I mean, it really gives you an experience in working like learning how to work in a work environment. You know, What's the dean's name? Who's the dean? Uh, of Ramin Talish. Okay. Yeah. Just came, right? Maybe. Huh? Recently came to UCI. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. And my interests are more with like disease prevention and health promotion and community health. So hopefully I'll go in my master's with public health. Mm -hmm. Do you have a place in mind? Have you already start thinking? Either UCI or Long Beach. Yeah. We have a great MPH program, actually. <coughs> not that Cal State Long Beach is not great. It's just <laughs> different. OK, another Jeffrey. Yeah, oh, good. Uh, I'm interning at Center for Behavioral Sciences. And uh, basically, I haven't gone in yet, but basically what we do is uh, we take care of autistic children mm -hmm. and help with their development. Um, it's just like the behavioral technicians that work there. And um, the reason it's a 
appealing to me is because my cousin has autism. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an interesting uh, thing to learn about. It doesn't necessarily um, directly correlate to my career. Uh, I want to get into physical therapy eventually, but I just thought it something interesting to learn about. Yeah, so your expectations are just to learn more. I mean, you already know about the the, the condition because you have a family member, but right. you want to know how this organization and others like it, you know, what they're doing to yeah. help the situation. So it's one of those diseases I could have mentioned at the beginning of the of the class today, where we see trends. It's increasing in the population. We don't fully understand why, and there have been a lot of you know ecological frameworks about autism. It's uh, behavior, it's the environment, it's genetics, and it's, it's such a complex, um, it, it sounds like a simple disease, or some people don't even call it a disease, but, um, but there are so many factors, and prevention is something we just have not been able to do well. So it, uh, lots of new things will come out of all the research that's been funded. And recently, the uh, the psychiatrist manual, DSM, I guess they call it, has kind of revised the definition so that we may see changes in the trends. Yes? Did you skip one? I skipped yours? I'm sorry. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> Rochelle. Rochelle, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, so Disney. All right, Rochelle, tell us. Yeah, cool. Oh, you're not? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know what it is. Oh, is there Rochelle? Rochelle? Okay, she's not here anyway. Okay. <laughs> Being vigilant, okay. But that's good that I know who's here and who's not here. Actually, this is not a complete list. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, Lauren. Oh, so oh, so home now. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm interning at the Aid Services Foundation of Orange uh -huh. County. And they provide various services to people with HIV and AIDS, including case management, they have a food pantry. Uh, they're in Laguna, have, right? Uh, they uh -huh. are in Irvine. Irvine, oh, okay. Um, food pantry, uh, vitamins, things like that. Uh, so what I'm doing specifically is uh, working on an education project for hepatitis C in mm -hmm. young IV drug users in Orange County. What appealed to you about working uh, there? I was kind of inspired by the AIDS Fundamentals class mm -hmm. at UCI. Yeah, and with uh, Tim Balik. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I kind of expect to learn the inner working of, of a nonprofit and also how big decisions up top affect ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And in the future, I want to study epidemiology. Okay, your PhD, epidemiology. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. We have one at UCI. There are lots of great programs. Okay, Lauren. Hi, um, I work with the UCI Medical Center, um, mm -hmm. the OB department, and I'm doing more of the um, administrative aspects, so it's kind of like billing and things like that, which is cool because um, I get like more of that um, management kind of hospital type experience. Um, so that's what was appealing to me about it. Um, Expectations. <coughs> you well, want to learn how to, to do that. Yeah, yeah I okay. just hope to get a different kind of aspect of um, <coughs> kind of how hospitals run and things like that. Okay, where are you headed? Um, hopefully law school. Yeah, because um, I mean criminal law, <laughs> because uh, it could be related to the to the management and the paperwork and the accounting. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to our website, something is, and pull up the roster. Because <coughs> that list was in, oh, 75 now. <laughs> Gee. Okay, but I have to not display. Student ID, email addresses,
Okay. Andrew. Is Andrew here? No? Oh, hi. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm working at Vitaly uh, mm -hmm. as well, but I'm on the wellness side. Um, what appeals to me most about the site is um, I get to like dive into a lot of diversity. So they're like a dentistry on some days, and then they do like naturopathic medicine some days, and then they do massage therapy some days, and nutrition testing some days, and like um, I like that because I feel like that could um, I get a little bit of everything. So I feel like when I walk out of there, I have like a little bit more knowledge about um, each topic, as well as um, they concentrate a lot on the business side of health, like health initiatives, like how people um, can promote a healthier lifestyle based on like just like healthier mind, a healthier body, like overall like like wellness. Yeah. So they don't just go to the companies. Um, companies can register with Vitaly, and they're. Employees um, it's mostly, come. It's mostly um, clients, and a lot of the clients are like regulars. So like, I see. Um, they usually dive into a little bit of everything in order to get full experience. Yeah. And I kind of like that because it's kind of like, like little building blocks together, and like all of it together, it's kind of that <coughs> person. And um, I expect I don't know just to get a little bit of everything, so that when I walk out of there, I'll have like I'll just grow as a person, and I want to become a physical therapist someday. So. At this site, I get a lot of like one-on-one -on -one client like interaction, so I hope that that can translate to what I want to do later in the future. Okay, which is what? Uh, physical therapy. Okay, wonderful. Uh, si Young. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, I'm currently training at UCI Human Resources Resources and Wellness Center. Oh, you're here. So yeah. what's where's the others? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe taking other classes. Okay, um, so um, like what they do is basically they provide like wellness programs for the staff and uh, profes professors and uh, workers here at UCI and they provide them like, like um, health contracts too I guess so, mm -hmm. like, so they can basically help them to work better here at UCI. High, highly stressful environment yeah, at UCI. Stressful and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and what do you want to do after you graduate? Um, I'm expecting to learn like Where the workers can get like any advice or any like programs, you know, for their stress relief, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Christopher. <coughs> Christopher with a K, not here. Oh, Kelly. Oh, she, Hello. he's here. Okay. <laughs> Speak up. Um, I'm interning at the OPU Grand Public Library, uh, in particular their homework club. Basically, just helping um, because the public library is basically right next to an elementary school campus. Mm -hmm. So, it's mostly helping them, and since it's a public library, also it can only come to the schools, high schoolers, with whatever homework they need. It's in a predominantly Latin neighborhood, mm -hmm. so mostly it's helping with um, English homework and like reading and stuff because uh, it's things that their parents can help them with because they never actually learned to read English. Uh, it's why, why you picked the library? Did you think it would have something related to public health? When um, you, I was actually interested in how it would be related to public health. Yeah. So that's a little kind of why. Okay. And you expect to find out, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what do you want to do after? Um, I honestly don't know what I'm going to do after. Yeah. <laughs> Except, yeah, graduate course. Yes, I skipped somebody. You skipped like 10 people. I skipped 10 people. <laughs> 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 so before Christopher, C. Young, Andrew. Oh, yeah, Fra Franchi. Okay, let's go back. Let's go up. We, we, I mean, I tell you. We, we can't probably get everybody today, but this, is, this will give me a, a fairly good idea. So uh, let's, um, and we'll continue next week, because I do want to know who you are and, and how we can uh, improve your experience there. So uh, we'll do Prachi, Nika. Tina, Lydia. Where, where do we? <laughs> so after. <laughs>
Tina? Yeah. Okay. Where's Tina? Right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where are you uh, doing your... Infant and toddlers. Yeah, and I didn't feel today because I used to intern at the hospital in the postpartum department, but they didn't really let us do anything with the babies. So I really wanted to get a chance to like interact with the babies and toddlers and actually get to see how they like develop. And like I expect to see like how they react to me when they get to know me better. Because right now they're like scared kind of yeah. or they're yeah. more feisty. I guess. Big stranger. Yeah. Okay. Oh so, yeah. And then I want to go into nursing. Okay. Um, so UCI has a master's in nursing and a PhD in nursing. Did you do you have a like you want to practice nursing, not not the academic stuff? Okay. Huh? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Johanna. Yeah. Oh, Two Johannas. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Johanna. Oh. <laughs> Huang. Um, I'm Cancer? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, there is the research, cancer advocacy, and health education. And it goes along with what I want to do because I want to go into health education also. Mm -hmm. And since they're a non profit, they work at the grassroots level. And actually, they're already like, I just started on Monday, but I'm already like doing a lot of stuff because like on Sunday, we have like an event for a tennis screening. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, Doing things like they're already like doing, like I'm already doing grant writing, and I'm like, I have no idea how to do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, no better way to learn than to immerse yourself in it. Immersion, it's a good strategy. Do you do you work in the same hours? You've never seen him. Well, oh, here, um, yeah, he started today. Okay, well, this is why we have class. So. What do you want? So, you want to. Going to what? Health education. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lydia. Hi. <coughs> Hi. Um, I'm interning at the American Heart Association um, as well. And I'll be working um, with various like health events, um, like raising money and trying to promote um, promote health, and especially like for like children. Um, mm -hmm. And so far, that's all I've been told. But um, I'm not sure what else. Yeah. And I expect to learn more about a nonprofit organization and also what it goes into holding such large events right. that um, raise money. And I hope to go to graduate school in epidemiology. Okay, wonderful. And and um, learn the methods to understand the causes. And, okay. Perfect. Uh, Shelley. Yeah. Minerals, yeah. Well, so I gave money to to that organization a long time ago. I thought what they did was donate prosthetics. Is that that's what they use the money for? And what do you want to do after? Well, it could be. It could be. Yeah. Think about the connection. Systems systems really work in amazing ways. I mean the USDA's policies and FDA's policies have a lot of impact on many other countries. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh Nika. Okay. Um, I'm interning at the UCI Early Childhood Education Center, and that was appealing to me because I've always really loved working with kids, and it's just a really fun and uplifting experience. Um, and also because I want to go into pediatrics, and I've done more clinical things, so I thought this was a good way to get on the other side of it. Um, what I expect is, I guess, to watch the way kids interact with each other and just learn more about how to like handle um, different situations and like, potential conflicts with kids that I can apply later. Mm -hmm. 
Um, did you talk about further education oh, or further just? Further education, yeah. I will be able to go into the pediatrics. Yeah. As a physician or as a nurse? Uh, I got actually just I'm going to be going to naturopathic medicine uh -huh. school next year, so I'm hoping to do like pediatric. Medicine. Where Where is the where, uh, which the it's one? It's Pasteur you? University in San Diego. San Diego. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, now uh, where are we? Please tell me where we are. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Kachi. Um, I'm interning at the Tia Foundation, and what that does is basically it helps um, refugees from um, the Middle East or Africa uh, assimilate to the lifestyle in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm going to be doing is I go to um, houses of these families and help the children, help to them um, if they have any questions or anything. So um, this appeals to me because I love children and I also want to hopefully go into pediatrics as a physician. And so just like gaining experience working with them, watching them, interacting with them. Um, okay. Immigrant health is a huge issue in Orange County. We're um, probably the second most diverse county in the country primarily because of immigration. And most people think of Orange County, they think only you know, the Latino, but there's so many um, other groups. And until you walk in a place like that, you don't see it. The school systems, uh, they see it too. OK, uh, thank you. Did we do Andrew? Uh, not me. No. No, okay, Andrew Kim. Uh, yeah, I'm interning at uh, Second Harvest Food Bank oh, yeah. in Irvine. Did you see our t shirt on the wall there? Uh, oh, no, oh, at the actual place? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. No? Yeah, no Next yeah. time you go and look. Yeah, yeah. We, I volunteer there, so oh. I give them my t shirt. Yeah. This t shirt. Oh, it's on the wall. <laughs> All right, yeah, but, so what, um, what do you do? The, what I'm doing is I'm actually in charge of conducting surveys at sites where they actually administer food to people. Mm -hmm. And the reason they are doing that is because they want to create, um, like, they want to find out um, exactly what type of people they are serving in the first place and right. basically who's in need of food um, in the Orange County area. So I'll be in charge of conducting surveys, which um, I guess gets information like demographics and like social and economic status, things like that. And the reason that appealed to me was, um, well, I've done like, uh, like homeless outreach things like in LA before, and yeah. so in that sense, I kind of have a little bit of experience like in the field of working with people. And my expectations are, um, I want to learn more about, I guess, the organization, like how it works, and also, hopefully through the internship, I'll be able to get more opportunities in the future to work with um, either that organization or other nonprofits that. Mm -hmm. Um, help people in need, and I think that's something that can relate to my future because I want to work with, yeah, like an organization that um, helps people either in so lower social and econo economic yeah. status or people in need. Yeah, we, um, we have a project called Hunger Eradication Project in Orange County, or HEPIC, and that site is one of our sites. Actually, the project starts with the city of Stanton, where um, there are lots of hungry people and yet there are lots of restaurants and we're trying to figure out how can you connect the you know, surplus with the deficiencies. And uh, some of our MPH students go to the, um, the food bank to volunteer their time on weekends. Okay, uh, so we can now go back to Gee, <laughs> this list is, uh, so we, we, uh, Kelly, is it Kelly Law? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm interning at 211 Orange County, and it's an information and referral service where you call, or people in crisis call, um, and we refer them to different agencies um, for shelter, food, like domestic violence centers, and places like that. Um, and what interested me is I'm really passionate about um, human trafficking and um, advocating for human trafficking. Um, so I thought along the lines of like human trafficking is also like um, sex abuse and domestic abuse. So I wanted something to help that. Um, and my expectations are to 
um, try to help as many people as I can. Um, and my future goals are to be a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. 211 uh, Foundation of Orange County is also working with us on the hunger eradication project. They have their own program. Last year, they gave our program an award because we have so many of our public health practicum students uh, working there. And at some point, they complained that they didn't have enough parking spaces for, for the students. But you don't have any problem with that this year. Okay. It's a great organization. Uh, Natasha. OK. Um, interning at the Legal Aid Society of Orange County uh, is a nonprofit organization that provides uh, free legal assistance, not advice, mm -hmm. to those that are involved in any kind of legal cases, maybe civil, um, child support, anything like that. But how it relates to public health is that they have a health consumer uh, agency within the Legal Aid Society where we find individuals the healthy the health care they need. Uh, individuals call in that may not, uh, don't have health insurance, so then we provide them advice on how to get health insurance, with, may it be private, um, government, as in Medi-Cal. Yeah. Um, Has the Affordable Care Act changed anything about <laughs> access? Uh, it changed a lot, yeah. actually. Um, it's, it's been changing. There's guidelines that are changed every day, so there's consistently meetings. I mean, today is my first day, and um, I watched a video tutorial on the basic information that uh, interns need. There's also a lot of uh, law students mm -hmm. that are there that need this basic public health information to help uh, individuals legally. Yeah. When they um, want help. And where, where are you headed after? Um, I actually have an internship lined up for me in the Bay Area right after I graduate. Hopefully I get a job afterwards there good, good. in healthcare administration, but I want to lead into that. That's to lead into getting my MJD in um, compliance, healthcare compliance. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, Helen, that's Helen, right? No, I'm Helen. Yeah, Helen. <laughs> Sorry, okay, Helen. Okay, so I've been training at the Lake Senior Center in Irvine, and we provide free healthcare really listened to what I wanted to do in the future, so she placed me in, in charge of holding health seminars, um, which is kind of funny because I'm not a fan of public speaking, but um, I pretty much gather all, I'll make flyers and I'll send it out to um, all the participants and I'm responsible for talking about all the different diseases and what's on. Um, on Monday we did diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only there on three days of the week, so each day is different. But in the future, I plan, well, I'm applying to med school this summer. Mm -hmm. What, do you send in applications before taking MCAT or do you? Oh, I took my MCAT already. already. Wonderful. I'm applying this coming cycle. What, what, what's your top choice? Uh, whatever I can get into. Oh. <laughs> 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 that is a best feature. Yeah. I do want to go into geriatrics, so this applies. That's a, uh, also a, a growing field of need because our demographic pyramid is shifting to. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. More, exactly, more elderly people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen. Okay. Um, I'm at the Adai Regional Medical Center, mm -hmm. and I'm at the case management department. Mm -hmm. They do a variety of things, but I guess one of the most important things is that for each patient that gets admitted, they make like a plan of care. So they just want to make that, make sure that their transition period is like from in the hospital out, they right. get what they need, type of thing, and. I wanted to do hospital management, but I'm kind of considering doing physician's assistant. PA is the most popular field. <laughs> I haven't really like, looked into yeah. it yet, but it's something I'm considering. Yeah. So. It's a flexible field yeah. because you can work with different. OK, thank you. Stephanie. Stephanie Mania from Maine, maybe. OK, not here. Uh, Breen. Not here. That's good. Yeah. We would yeah. be done quickly. Fabio? Fabio Mattarelli. Maybe they give me another list. I don't know. Blake? Yeah, Blake is here. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm interning for uh, 
Orange County Cross Keeper. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nonprofit that mostly does um, education, advocacy, and enforcement <coughs> of the laws that apply to certain marine areas, like um, like Lagoon Beach is one of them. Um, I was interested in them because um, I'm interested in environmental health and mm -hmm. its relationship to human health. Um, that's probably something I want to go to grad school for, but I'm not sure um, like what type of program that would be. Yeah, it's a very strong part of our public health program. There are many people who do research on environmental health, but not just in public health. Uh, there's a lot, a very strong water group in civil and environmental engineering and we had somebody get their PhD there and then come to get our MPH because they really, um, that person did fecal coliform pollution uh, along the, the coast and we often have that kind of problem and it's appealing to this, this group that you're working with. Um, and then there's another group in the School of Medicine that kind of is interested in this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, we'll do it just a few more and then. Um, I'm interning at the Back Bay Science Center in Upper okay. Newport Bay. And so uh, basically it kind of um, overlooks preservation of the local marine wildlife in that area. Um, it serves as like kind of more of an educational facility and a preservation facility. So they set up programs for um, 7th to 12th graders and they can come in and like learn about the local um, wildlife and marine like wildlife and then um, they can actually go into the bay and like do kind of like experiments and like dig through the, the sand and stuff and then we just kind of help to um, set up those programs as well as we're going to help like, teach these kids and stuff. Um, I, I was interested in it because I have an interest in environmental like preservation and I really want to work with kids um, future-wise and I'm not sure if I'm going to go into what I'm interning at right now but I'm interested in more of like arts and health arts and health education. Um, <clears throat> maybe during the quarter I'll share with you an article I wrote called Topophilia and the Quality of Life. And it was written because our campus at some point hired a very well-known architect, uh, Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam uh, Memorial in DC to build the water table by the arts um, school here because they believe that uh, that would be very helpful in helping people distress after you know studying so, so much. So she does a lot of work to use art, sculpture, architecture um, to do prevention. Very interesting uh, area of work. Okay, uh, so that's is that Jennifer? Did we already do Jennifer? Yeah, Jennifer. Uh, I'm also interning for the Vietnamese uh, American Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. And it's a nonprofit organization that like helps prevent cancer and educate the Vietnamese community about cancer and preventing it and providing services such as like screenings. Um, what appealed to me about the organization is that it deals with the Vietnamese communi uh, community. And I'm Vietnamese and I also kind of want to learn more about my community because I don't mm -hmm. know much about it. And also I just want to see how they apply like certain methods to um, reaching out to the community and informing them about cancer and how to prevent it and stuff. And um, I also want to become a nurse, so that's my future. Okay, it's all jelly. All right, thank you. Um, gosh. Is it uh, Jennifer? That was Jennifer, right? Yeah. Andrew. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm in your turn at the Earth Resource Foundation. Uh -huh. There, um, what is it, the projects that I work on that deal with contacting high schools and getting them to do um, recycling, um, drive, and like informing them more about like how we can not waste so much mm -hmm. of our resources. Um, for me, this is more like a community service event um, to my 100 hours because um, career-wise I want to go into like finance, financial um, analysis and um, my long-term goal is hopefully to be like a hedge fund. Yeah. You, don't, you don't see how recycling could be a major uh, business opportunity that would make a lot of money for finances? I think in the immediate future, I think that's pretty hard. Yeah. 
Why do you think so? Um, because, what is it? It's like a lot of these businesses, they're already very, very profitable. And then you're walking in there and you're trying to tell them, like, oh, you should recycle. Mm -hmm. And you're telling them to invest a lot more money to make it so that they can recycle. And a lot of businesses, they're very reluctant to make that change. Yeah. So uh, seven years ago, I, I got a grant, $1.5 million from the National Science Foundation to study recycling of electronic waste. Um, and at the time, people thought that there can't be money in this thing. <laughs> but you know, all of these computers and cell phones, they have precious metals, and it's become one of the hottest commodities. And it's making a lot of money for the recyclers who got in early. Maybe you'll revise your opinion. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kami? Right across the street from here. Um, no, it's in Tustin. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Exactly yeah. Once a week or so. And um, what got me interested in it was that, or since I was like an infant, I've had different lung conditions. Mm -hmm. I've had asthma all my life. I've had bronchitis so many times, pneumonia like 10 times. Like right now, I'm like coughing. And sorry. But um, so I just really want to get involved with that and kind of see what kind of promotion we could do with American Lung in their efforts. So I actually started there about a month and a half ago in the middle of winter quarter. Mm -hmm. And um, we're in the last six months of a two-year project called Smoke Free OC, which is um, implementing more, or trying to implement more strict policies and lobby for those throughout Buena um, Park, Costa Mesa. And so um, we're just working on that right now. And, yeah. and what do you want to do after? Um, I actually want to get into clinical research. And so um, that's what I'm working into right now. But I also wanted to see more of the policy side. Mm -hmm. That's why I chose this internship, because I've been taking the science classes. So it's interesting to see how much it's working. Okay, thank you. Um, we can either stop here or we can do Catherine. Is Catherine here? Do you want to go now? Okay, let's do Catherine, and then we'll probably go. She already has a bad part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm at the OC Child Abuse Prevention Center. And um, basically, what happens there is, well, I work with the monitored visitation. So we monitor the um, visitation between the parents and the children. And um, I guess it just appeals to me because uh, it's just interesting to see how different ethnicities uh, deal with this situation, I guess. And, um, what you I actually work with the victims or yeah so okay. actually I observe um, I sit in with the parents and the children and I just observe uh, their interactions and I I log it down so basically everything they do and everything they say we take note of to see if um, I guess the programs that the parents are taking the classes are actually being implemented and if they actually learn something from these classes so that they can actually graduate and essentially get their children back. So what do you want to do after you graduate? Well, I want to be a physician. Okay. Good. Yeah. Please tell me your name. Will you remind me that we're... <laughs> okay, thank you. See you all next week.